professor of sociology here. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Circle of Thought series, where today we have one of my favorite colleagues, uh, Caroline Streeter, associate professor of English here at UCLA. Um, she's going to talk to you about some really interesting research. Um, uh, Professor Streeter um, teaches interdisciplinary courses in literature, film, visual arts, and popular culture. Um, she's a faculty affiliate of the uh, Bunn Center. Uh, she received her BA in Feminist Studies from Stanford and her PhD in Ethnic Studies uh, uh, with a designated emphasis in women, gender, and sexuality from UC Berkeley. Uh, she has a forthcoming book, um, Tragic No More, Mixed Race Women at the Nexus of Sex and Celebrity. And I think today's presentation is, is from that work. Mm -hmm. um, it's a study of how celebrity mixed race women figure in the continual reinvention of race in the U.S. Uh, in our popular culture, uh, our millennial turn of the century. Uh, she argues that women such as Holly Berry, Mar Mariah Carey, symbolize the tragic mulatto sexual transgression of racial boundaries, a move signifying both erotic power and the risk of annihilation. Uh, it's very provocative work. Um, I will leave it at that and turn the podium over to her to kind of present this important work to us. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Dr. Hunt, and thank you, Alex Tucker, for inviting me to this really terrific series, The Circle of Thought. Um, I presented here, I think, gosh, six years ago or something like that. It's been quite a while, so I'm really happy to be here today. And uh, thank you to my students, X and Current, for coming. It's really lovely to see familiar faces here. Um, so as Dr. Hunt said, my book is called Tragic No More, um, Women, Mixed Race Women at the Nexus of Race, Sex, and Celebrity. And so what the book is about, what the book, Excuse me? Do you want me to do that so you can talk? Uh, sure, that's terrific. Thank you so much, Mark. So what the book is about is the ways in which mixed race women, basically starting in the early 1990s and continuing into the present, are are, are working through, are making, are serving a function in our contemporary society of working through race in terms of its historical its historical ramifications as well as what is happening currently. So basically what I argue is that there are two, two discourses or two narratives that are familiar to us with regard to mixed race in the United States. One is the narrative that dates from the slave experience where the mulatto is the sign of the rape of black women, it's the sign of shame and race mixing, and it's also a troubling indicator that the black so-called race wasn't able to protect its boundaries. So the way that black identity constitutes itself in the United States, it's the one drop rule as an effect of the way that black people were classified by the United States, and that's an identity that's, that's been um, taken on by African Americans, right? Because it's something that's been projected. So, so we have that mulatto of history, and then we have the mixed race movement of the late 20th century, the so-called mixed race movement of the late 20th century, that basically takes its origins from 1967 when the, all of the miscegenation laws or laws that prevented people of different races to intermarry, those laws were finally all overturned by federal law. And so until 1967, at least 15, 16 southern states had laws against interracial marriage, and those laws persisted the longest uh, in terms of preventing marriage between blacks and whites. Although actually, parenthetically, here in California, those laws persisted a very long time with regard to intermarriage between whites and <coughs> Asians. So there's a whole different kind of discourse here of the yellow peril, you know, and um, a really similar idea of the 
the virginal white woman or the pure white woman who is going to be threatened, right, by the the kind of um, the 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 colored man of bestial sexual appetites. So, so with regard to black identity in the contemporary period, it is the case that. Black people are constituted, right, across all different race, racial mixtures, across all different kinds of physical appearance. Um, and it just so happens that the, um, the rates of interracial marriage between blacks and whites are the smallest of any interracial marriage rate in the United States. So, so just to give you an example of what is happening with regard to mixed race in terms of other ethnic groups in the US, In terms of the Japanese American community, for example, and as you know, the vast majority of Asian American communities are here in California. So in terms of the Japanese American community, there are actually more people of mixed descent, mostly Asian American and white. Their birth rates exceed people who have two Japanese, Japanese American parents. So things like um, the, the, the blood quantum rules for Miss Cherry Blossom, for example, and for the Japanese American basketball teams are changing, right? So although we have these real changes in terms of other ethnic groups, the rates are really, the rates are higher, but the mulatto has always been the main um, symbol of the ways that the races can bridge difference and the ways that the races can mix and has transformed into a positive symbol, sort of the, the ultimate symbol of the, the way in which the two most oppositional races in the United States can come together. And therefore, racial healing has this, has this um, significance, right? Has this extra significance. Okay, so my thesis is that the contemporary mulatto is formed by this idea of the new rainbow nation and the mixed race person who is the positive representation of bridging <coughs> racial boundaries, bridging racial barriers and, um, and uh, breaking racial boundaries in the United States. But, but the mulatto also is a reminder, triggers these historical ideas that have to do with, um, that have to do with the stereotypes of uh, the warring bloods, right? The, the two bloods that are, that can't survive in one body. And so the mulatto, the tragic mulatto, who's this uh, figure from mostly African-American literature, the tragic mulatto is the symbol of the figure that cannot um, bear being the body of the mixture of races. And so it's usually a woman, and it's usually a very kind of exotic and beautiful woman, right? But she's doomed. Okay, so what I have here are two examples of mixed race women who are both big pop stars, music stars, let's just say music for now. It's Mariah Carey and Alicia Keys. And Mariah Carey, as you probably know, emerged in about 1990 as this very significant artist. And at the same time, there was controversy, controversy about her racial identity. So white critics, well, first of all, Sony Records, um, who, who who mentored her as an artist, right? Tommy Mottola, whom she married at one point, mentored her as an artist. And it seems that Sony Records was, was complicit in some way in, in presenting her as a racially ambiguous artist, right? So she was already being constructed as a crossover artist without it being really set, you know? So, Early on, there were, for example, articles in Ebony Magazine. One of the first articles in a black press, I think, was the one in Ebony Magazine, 
and that one said, Mariah Carey, not just another white girl trying to sing black, and at the same time, you had white music critics who, who uh, reviewed her albums saying, it's really unclear why a white singer <laughs> has roots in such black traditions, such black musical idioms, right? And she herself has been represented as a tragic mulatto and, and, or also the sexualized erotic mulatto, right? So you'll see in almost every image of her on the cover of a magazine, Mariah Carey, it's about lust and mixed race melodrama, right? So this is from Vibe magazine in 1998. Miss Carey busts loose on Whitney, Derek Jeter, love, and lust and mixed race melodrama. And that's basically how she is represented on the cover of magazines and, and um, also in this very ambiguously raced style, kind of long blonde hair and it's really the hair, right, is the main signifier. Okay, so can I have the next slide please? All right, so now we have Alicia Keys, who, as you know, emerged on the scene in uh, 2001. And I think her first public appearance was at the concert for Heroes in 2001, right after 9-11, the concert that I think they played the very next day. And she sang a Stevie Wonder song, and she accompanied herself on the piano, and she was really riveting, you know? Um, she was this new voice, she was very beautiful, and right at the beginning, her look was distinctly African American, mainly because of the braids, right? In terms of her physical appearance, she and Mariah Carey are strikingly similar. They have more or less the, sta the same skin tone. They have brown eyes. You know, their, their, their features are, again, you know, ambiguous. It's, it's like, like, right, if, if you haven't met a black person who looks like her, then you might not be able to identify her racially, right? But most African Americans actually could, could identify her even without the hair, right? Because there's a certain mixed race look. Now, I'm not saying that African Americans have this kind of specialized racial radar and we always know, right? Because that's not true. Because, because passing, you know, passing can go either way. But but um, but uh, Clive, Clive Davis um, on Arista, she's, she's his artist, and she was very intentionally marketed, I think, very intentionally marketed as um, an R&B artist rather than a pop singer like Mariah Carey, and very much so very much in the African musical idiom and very, and very or African American, and very much <laughs> presented with this um, African American aesthetic. So can I have the next slide, please? All right. So in 2001, what was happening to Mariah when Alicia was bursting on the scene as this beautiful, you know, new black artist. Well, as some of you know, Mariah Carey was also in the concert for Heroes in 2001. And she seemed really fragile. I mean, I've, some of you who saw the concert may know what I'm talking about. Um, she seemed really fragile and she sang Heroes, which is a really famous song of hers. And her backup singers were literally <coughs> taking the strong voice parts for her. And she has an incredible voice, right? It goes, spans several octaves, et cetera. Um, but her, her movie, Glitter, was about to come out at this point. And in fact, Glitter was uh, scheduled to come out on September 12th. Now, right at the same time that this was happening, you can see here, this is August 11th, right? So right around the, the same number of weeks, 
Mariah had a so-called nervous breakdown, right? And you can see here how the pressures of stardom turn Mariah Carey's hope for a new beginning into a world of pain. So the new beginning that they're referring to is that she left um, Tommy Mottola and Sony Records and she embarked on um, uh, a different kind of, not a different career exactly, but well, they say that on her al album Honey, which is the first album that came out after she left um, Sony, uh, she worked with a number of black artists, right? She worked with, uh, he was called, I think, I think it was still Puff Daddy, right? Not P. Diddy yet. Um, she had Bone Thugs in Harmony on one of her songs. You know, she worked with um, both black producers and and these hip hop artists, right? So, um, because not only the black press but the white press are really fixed on Mariah Carey as a tragic figure, uh, there what and also as a possibly not authentic figure, right? Because that was always the sort of um, the sort of uh, question. Is she black or is she white? And part of the reason that that was so interesting to people is that she actually didn't say, I'm a black woman, or like Alicia Keys, kind of present herself unambiguously, right, as a black artist. So what I'm saying is that the fact that she had a breakdown and the fact that she was presented in this particular tragic way is a function of who she is as an artist. It's a function of how she's been marketed. And, um, and also, with regard to working with black artists, she was represented as something as somebody who was very sexual, right? That this, this so-called transition to working with black artists happened after leaving uh, Sony Records, which was also and she, the dissolution of her marriage to Tommy Mottola, and, and then allegedly she's moving on and, and basically, you know, drinking Cristal with P. Diddy or Puff Daddy in the club, you know, in the club, right? Bottle of Bub. I mean, 50 Cent was, 50 Cent is, is, is he, he's not there yet, right? But that's kind of the, the idea. Um, so, uh, let me have the next slide, please. All right, so, Right around the same time, Alicia Keys is moving into um, the mainstream uh, black magazines, right? So whereas Mariah Carey has been on Glamour and, um, and uh, Marie Claire and Allure and a whole number of magazines that are aimed at a white, you know, a mainstream women's audience, which is basically a white women's audience. That's not where Mariah, or sorry, Alicia Keys started out. She really started out in the black press. And again, signifying as black, right? Not only with her hair, but for example here, Alicia Keys and Roberta Flack compare notes. So right away she's associated, you know, with a black music idiom. Um, and can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so if you recall the 1998 Vibe magazine cover with Mariah busting loose on, you know, sex and love and mixed race and love and mixed race melodrama, here's Alicia Keys in um, September 2002, again, just after she's emerged as an artist, on the Juice, right, uh, cover with a big afro, which appeared once and never again, I might add, right, I've never seen an afro on this woman again on the cover of a magazine, but big afro, black rather than brown, right, we know her hair is brown actually, these jeans that have a black power salute, and of course the kind of combination of um, 
being sexualized, right, and having this black power, this black power uh, uh, symbolism. So, so I think right away we can see that, of course, she's being represented in a sexualized way, right? Pretty much women music stars are, but she's associated with the the elite of music rather than mixed race melodrama. Okay, could I have the next slide, please? Okay, now here's Alicia Keys just four years later. This is how she looks, this is, this is how her look developed. And um, you can see that, of course, she has the long feathery hair and uh, then, and, and, and she's wearing, and she's wearing glamorous clothing. And what I am arguing is that by the time Alicia Keys, I mean, she won, I think her album came out in 2002, right around the time also of 9-11. Um, by the time she, by the time uh, 2005 comes around, I say her, identity as a black woman artist, right, has been solidified. So there's no need to break out the cornrows and the black power fists because we know, right? And so I think that she makes the transition to a glamorous black woman that we see with all kinds of different um, black artists, right? We see it with somebody like Aaliyah, she's actually a really good example of somebody who is like hood rat kind of, you know, sunglasses and, and hats and big, you know, uh, big bulky jeans. And not a long time later, suddenly she's prancing around in really tight clothes and she has long, you know, long straight hair. And, and she's, I mean, she is a beautiful girl, right? But it's a transition from a kind of a kind of gendering that is that is not as feminized, right? To a kind of gendering that's glamour, right? Okay, so can I have the next slide please? All right, so here we are with Mariah. 17 months later still talking about the tragic breakdown, right? This will not go away. Um, so, so in in the interim, the film glitter came out, and it was roundly panned. People people made fun of it. It was, and interestingly, it was the story of mostly her story. It was the story of a young mix, mixed race girl who has a black mom and a white dad, and she becomes not an orphan, but she becomes a kid who goes into foster care because her father abandons her mother and her mother can't raise her alone. And then she has two best friends, and one is the brat, right, the black best friend, and one is Tia, I think her name is Tia Carrera, Carrere, the Latina best friend, right? So they're this great multiracial trio. And the film is set in the 1980s. And so that's kind of the multiracial moment in the club scene. And so she produced an album that's actually really interesting. It's got all of this, um, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's got songs like, Last night a DJ saved my life. You know, it's, I mean, I think they're great songs. Um, but she was roundly panned for the movie and she was actually ridiculed for the movie, right? Um, jokes like, jokes I heard include, include Osama bin Laden. We can't find Osama bin Laden and he, because he's hiding in the back row at Glitter, right? Or um, there's, that, that was, that was a, a joke that, oh, and I think that was a, Glitter was actually, Billy Crystal used a joke about glitter at the Oscars as well. So it was kind of this thing that was going around. It was also on uh, that, that sit, well not sitcom exactly, but that show, uh, the one about the young mom with the kid. Anyway, I can't remember, but, but. It was, it was sort of this cultural thing that came out to make fun of her, to kind of ridicule her. Okay, so 17 months after hospitalization, she's still a sexy singer, right? 
That, fortunately, she didn't lose that. The sexy singer opens up about the suicide attempt rumors, Eminem, and her hot new album. So Mariah Carey is kind of constantly in this cycle of, of decline and then reinventing herself. Decline and reinventing herself. Whereas Alicia Keys has really been on this upward climbing trajectory ever since the beginning of her career. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, are we done? Yeah, that was it. Okay, so, um, so let me, let me, actually, let's, and let's just shut down the computer and maybe turn on the lights. So, so I, I can say a couple of more things before we open it up for questions. And uh, the first is that pop culture, and especially pop print culture, has this repetitive cycle, uh, as you know, where we, we kind of see the same things over and over again. But I'll, I will say that Alicia Keys has never been on the cycle of People Magazine or Us Weekly, that kind of tabloid, tabloid magazine that is exposing people's problems and exposing the drama. Alicia Keys remains on uh, either the covers of music magazines or the covers of the women's magazines that she's graduated to, right, now that she is a full-fledged star and also now that she's made the transition to a glamorous black woman. So for example, some of you probably know her videos. Her one of her earliest videos, because you know her songs, was the one, I keep on falling, right? Keep on falling in love, etc. Well, that video was her visiting her lover in prison because he's, you know, like, I guess, right? All, all black men spend, spend some kind of time in prison. But anyway, right? She's, she visits the prison and she is in love with him and she's, you know, uh, being, being loyal to her man. And she's wearing the cornrows, etc. So just a few years later for the song My Boo, which is Usher's song and she was the, she sang with him, she has long straight hair and she's wearing a silky slip and she's laying back on, the, you know, on the, on the bed on the satin sheets. So she goes again from this image of authentic kind of you know, like, what is it, ride or die kind of girl, right, with her husband to video vixen. Now, uh, in the case of Mariah Carey, what I'm sure you all know is that she married Nick Cannon recently and she had those little twin babies. Um, and what I'm going to be really interested in is how that might arrest the the tragic mulatto image, right? How, how that might play out. She was clearly authenticated, I think, by a black husband, and that's something that, that uh, mixed race women kind of need. I mean, or even mixed race men. Think about Barack Obama, right? Barack, if Barack Obama was married to a white woman, there is no way he'd be in the White House. Absolutely no way. No, no, no. And matter of fact, 1967, the, the um, Loving versus State of Virginia, which was the case that overturned the laws against interracial marriage, that was a white man and a black woman. Some of you may know that. And I actually, it occurred to me not, not that long ago that I actually can't imagine had the case gone before the Supreme Court with a black man and a white woman, which is actually the dominant gender mm -hmm. couple of interracial marriage between white people and black people, overwhelmingly, right? I'm sure many of you know that. So imagine the test case. It's really hard to imagine that test case actually succeeding. So it's interesting to think about the sort of privilege and authority that are granted to one type of interracial marriage, which is, of course, 
the interracial marriage that triggers the historical discourse of slavery and rape and um, the, the, um, the disinherited mulatto. The, the discourse of black men and white women is also it's really interesting and, and kind of troubling. The kinds of, the kinds of things that have been said about it, I, I could say, I could characterize it in two ways, I think, that women like Michelle Wallace, writing in the 60s, argued that black men were attracted to white women because this is the prized, pure wom woman that, that, was, that was not allowed for them during slavery. And now, there's another story that's commonly told, which is that white women have socioeconomic mobility, that white women are a certain kind of ornament, I guess, you know, for, for black male celebrities. And so when you, think about, when you think about black men who are married to famous black men, you know, Kobe Bryant and I don't know, there's, there's a number of them, Harold Ford Jr., and who that seal seal exact that's all over right but yes so so there's a there's kind of um there's kind of a resentment about that because of the whole idea that you know there's this terrible uh, shortage of partners for black women you know etc and if you're a doctor how can you go out with a bus driver I mean all of this ridiculousness as far as I'm concerned right the 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 whole thing about scarcity I think is ridiculous but in any case um, so in any case what I wanted to contrast with regard to Mariah Carey and Alicia Keys now is this repetitive cycle of Mariah Carey representing the really problematic mulatto and the way in which she can be authenticated by a real black man. It's similar, I think, to the way in which Barack Obama was authenticated by a real black woman. And also, you know, imagine had he been married to Mariah Carey. I mean, I don't know, you know. <laughs> mm, I don't know. Whereas with Alicia Keys, not only does she not have that kind of circulation in those kinds of magazines, but her marriage to Swiss Beats, her pregnancy, she just had a baby, that wasn't in the tabloids at all. Whereas the fascination with, you know, Mariah, she couldn't get pregnant, you know, the tragedy again of her infertility, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really striking that Alicia Keys is actually a figure who is, I think, taken more seriously and isn't a part of that cycle of, um, that cycle of fascination with broken celebrities, right? The kind of celebrities that go through the cycle that that kind of tabloid publication wants to represent. And it's a tabloid publication, people, us, star, you know, in touch to some extent, that that recycles celebrities and recycles them in a way that they kind of go from broken to put back together to broken to put back together. And the mulatto is um, a, a, a perfect kind of figure to go through that cycle because that's the way the mulatto works in American history, right? The cycle of the representation of kind of, you know, the very painful history of disavowal and disinheritance of black people and the contemporary <laughs> the contemporary the contemporary use of the mulatto actually sometimes often to to give a to give a positive face to black people, right? So for example, the way in which Mariah Carey has married Nick Cannon, that is black authentication for her. For him, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, oh, sorry, it's not just status. Uh, gosh, I can't think, capital, that's what it is. It's capital, it's capital. So he acquires a kind of 
a kind of visibility. It's kind of like Bobby Brown and Whitney Houston, only thank goodness, <laughs> thank goodness it's not Bobby, it's not Bobby Brown, thank goodness it's not, right? I mean, Nick Cannon, it's like, who could be more different from Bobby Brown, right? But it's, it's, a, it's a similar thing where um, a man who's not nearly as famous, etc., acquires a certain kind of cultural capital. And we could argue that with Alicia Keys and Swiss Beats, maybe it's kind of similar. I mean, when I saw that marriage, I thought, hmm, how long do they think that's going to last, you know? <laughs> but, I mean, you know, because I think about celebrities all the time. And in addition, I'll just point out that, again, with regard to taking Alicia Keys very seriously, if you recall, there was the Vanity Fair series of um, these very prominent people. Uh, so, for example, it was President Bush and, you know, Warren Buffett. Do you remember this? It was in 2007. It was a whole series. It was, it was, they were whispering to each other, you know, Iman whispers in Oprah Winfrey's ear. And Alicia Keys <laughs> was in that series because she has a, um, she has a, a, ch a charity, which is called Keep a Child Alive, which is an AIDS charity that works in Africa. So, so the kinds of things that get, that get, that get, uh, that get publicized about her are very much more the kinds of things that take her seriously, that link her to African American culture, that authenticate her as a black woman. And I think that's that's a place I'll that's, I'll stop because I I want to have time to um, have have questions and answers and discussion. Yes, Alex. Well, thank you again for for your talk. I want to bring in uh, someone that you mentioned six years ago, and if you could kind of compare and contrast um, her as a mulatto with Mariah Carey and Alicia Keys, and that's Halle Berry. Yes. Well, of course. <laughs> Halle Berry is the other person that I work on a lot. And I look at Mariah Carey and Alicia Keys together because of the musical connection and because not only do they, they get contrasted in terms of what, what kind of mulatto they are, but she's a pop singer, Alicia Keys is an R&B singer, and pop is associated with not only with whiteness, but with you know people who aren't very smart. So, with regard to Halle Berry, she's of course an enormously important figure. She actually, as you know, places herself in, in uh, the continuum of great black actresses. She characterizes herself as basically fulfilling, the, fulfilling what Dorothy Dandridge could not achieve, which is not only winning the Academy Award, but also having a career. So, so Dorothy Dandridge uh, was the actress. She, she, was, she was the actress <clears throat> who was most, who, who was considered most poised at the, at the cusp of being able to become uh, a serious dramatic actress. Because at that point in the late 1940s, 1950s, when she was an actress, um, black women were cast, actually interestingly enough, black women were often cast in mammy roles and tragic mulatto roles. Mm -hmm. So you had people, for example, like <laughs> Freddie Washington, who played the mulatto in Imitation of Life, and her mother, uh, who, Louise Beavers, who was absolutely fantastic in that role. But there are other combinations like that in the movie Pinky. It's uh, Ethel Waters, who is the, the you know, large black grandmother, loving black grandma, and her granddaughter, I believe. It's her granddaughter rather than her mother. And in this case, Pinky the Mulatto is portrayed by um, a white actress. And there was a stage show that I, that I, I, haven't, I haven't seen whether or not uh, it was filmed, but this stage show called Mamba's Daughters, where, where Ethel Waters played Freddie Washington's mother. So, in the case of Halle Berry, Halle Berry's career, up to the point where she won the Oscar, she, she put herself in as the 
as the person inheriting the mantle of Dorothy Dandridge, she, she played Dorothy Dandridge in this movie called Introducing Dorothy Dandridge. And at that point, she actually, she actually, uh, uh, she bought the rights to the book that Dorothy Dandridge's manager, Earl Mills, wrote. But Whitney Houston <clears throat> bought the rights to the Donald Bogle biography, the African American film film uh, critic and and uh, historian, who who was amazing. He he wrote this book called Brown Sugar, which is about African American actresses through the ages, and his biography of Dorothy Dandridge is amazing, <laughs> absolutely amazing. So Whitney Houston bought the rights to that one, but like so many different kinds of projects in Hollywood, it didn't come to fruition. But Janet Jackson wanted to play Dorothy Dandridge. Um, Jasmine Guy wanted to play Dorothy Dandridge. I mean, she is she is the sort of uh, the ancestral actress, right? The touchstone, because again. She was poised to be a serious dramatic actress, but there were no roles for her. She was in Carmen Jones, which is the all the the uh, film version of Carmen, the opera, uh, directed by Otto Preminger, and he cast an all-black cast, and she was Carmen. And that film went to the Cannes Film Festival. Dorothy Dandridge became the first black actress nominated for an Academy Award for Cameron Jones. And although she didn't win, that was a historical breakthrough. I mean, I get goosebumps talking about it, actually. There's actually, there's fantastic footage of Dorothy Dandridge at the awards, just because she was so beautiful. You know, she's, she, I mean, you know, like those actresses like Marilyn Monroe, right? She exuded, she was, she was illuminated, you know, luminous. She just exuded this star quality that stars do. That's the kind of person she was. So, Halle Berry, Halle Berry, I'll just say, I'll just talk, I'll just say, with regard to her most recent, you know, it's like, there's a drama, and there's, you know, her work. So, in the, in the context of her work, she has, she works as a producer and as an actress <laughs> like no other African American actress. And the fact that she produces is very, very significant. So the movie Catwoman, she co-produced that. You know, for that movie, she won the, the um, there's, this, uh, there's this award for the worst, the Razzies, right, right? So she won a Razzie for, yeah. Um, and uh, so, okay, so she's a producer, she's a star. Her failures, I think, are on the, along the lines of somebody like Jennifer Lopez, you know, a big star who has a film that crashes and burns. That happens every once in a while. It's not going to kill her as a film actress, like for Mariah Carey, right? Um, so, uh, and she actually has been trying to bring a project to the screen, which is, a, um, a biopic about Philippa Schuyler, who was a very well-known biracial piano player in the 1940s and 50s. She was the daughter of George Schuyler, this um, very famous conservative black writer. He was a journalist, and he also wrote a book called Black No More, which was a science fiction book about um, black people uh, being able to uh, be transformed for their so, so their skin is completely white, right? And uh, and I won't you know I won't say more, but but that's his famous that's his famous novel. It's really amazing. So Philippa Schuyler was incredibly famous. I mean, much more famous than he was in terms of in terms of um, a concert pianist. But people basically don't remember her. Uh, so, and she died very young. She was only, only 34. She died in 1967. <clears throat> so Halle Berry wants to produce a film about Philippa Schuyler starring Alicia Keys. And as you know, Alicia Keys is herself a classical pianist, right? And in that sense, I think that, so 
interestingly, again, Alicia Keys is going to, if this ever comes to fruition, which we never know with films, but Alicia Keys will play a troubled biracial character, but she's also authenticated by the fact that she's a classical pianist, right? So it's going to be really interesting to see if, if that ever, ever happens. Um, Okay, so with regard to crashing and burning, <laughs> as you know, Halle Berry was married to that very hot Canadian model, uh, Gabrielle Aubry, I think his last name is. Gabrielle? I think it's Aubry. And uh, had a baby with him, Nala. And they were not married, but now they're separating, and the custody of the baby is a big controversy because apparently she's pulling out the one drop rule and saying that the white father really won't know how to raise a black daughter. How can he be a father to her daughter? So I thought that was fascinating because she's. Because she's, um, she definitely sees herself as a black woman, but all three of them, Mariah Carey, Alicia Keys, and Halle Berry, are, were raised by white, white moms, had absent black dads, um, black dads who had trouble, you know, alcoholism. Uh, in the case of Mariah Carey and Halle Berry, there was abuse, domestic violence. So uh, they have this... They have this, this kind of, kind of like Barack Obama when he said, I could no more disavow my white grandmother when he talked about Reverend Wright. And then, of course, a few weeks later, it turned out that he could disavow <laughs> Reverend Wright, right? <laughs> she was no longer, oh, black grandmother, did I say that? I meant white, white grandmother. I meant white grandmother. So he held on to the white grandmother, but... Reverend Wright had to go. Um, so, so anyway, you know, there, there are these personal, uh, personal relationships with white, white relatives that, that we know about. So I am actually not up to speed on the Gabrielle Aubrey Halle Berry debacle over Nala. Uh, but, okay, okay. But I'll say one more thing about Halle Berry. And and I have this, this art piece. It's not really, you know, I like, anyway. So I have this, this, I have this art piece. It's called Hello, Goodbye. And it's uh, color Xerox copies of Halle Berry from when she was about in high school to how she looks now. And what you can see are a very subtle series of plastic surgeries that have made her into the most beautiful black woman in the world, right? Whatever. And, and um, she is almost unrecognizable. I guess not unrecognizable, but her features have been altered dramatically. Dramatically. And there is a very kind of dishonest way in which uh, critics don't talk about it. Because there are, there's a whisper campaign about different black celebrities who have had different um, plastic surgeries. And Vivica Fox actually came out about her nose job, which was really fabulous. But, but with Halle Berry, there's literally, I'll bring it in. I'll make copies and put it in the, put it in the Bunch Center library. Awesome. We'll put it on the website. The website, that's right. Feature. Yep, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so it, so it says, hello, hi, Halle. In the, in the very first picture, she's in a, it's like she's at Mardi Gras or something like that. And it goes, and then at the end, and she's waving like this. And at the end, I put that Mardi Gras picture again, right, at, right after you've seen the latest Halle Berry. Because it's not only plastic surgery, it's also major, um, you know, uh, implants. And, and so I end it with, bye, Halle. So it's hi bye. That's it's it's called hello goodbye, and it starts hi Hallie and it ends bye Hallie. Hmm. Well, I know we're out of time, but but I've been thinking as you've been talking, I've really enjoyed the presentation. Very very interesting. Um, 
there's an interesting relationship going on with these different figures between sort of uh, representation and I guess so-called reality. Mm -hmm. The way it's mm -hmm. sort of altered and they've all, they often try to sort of position themselves relative to changing realities with the various types of representation. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I think about it, and I guess maybe this is a sociologist to me, thinking about the different periods and different, you know, uh, uh, social context in which each of them emerged and in which they're still trying to remain relevant, mm -hmm. it seems like they've sort of evolved. Mm -hmm. and I think we're currently in a period with Obama, I'm glad you, you finally did mention Obama and the fact that he himself is biracial. Yes. Um, and that, that's clearly a different environment than mm -hmm. some of the other folks emerged in. I guess all of them emerged prior to his, his election. Mm -hmm. But without, I guess, um, injecting my own Oh, go ahead and about, inject. You know, how these things may have been evolving, like say when Alicia Keys comes along mm -hmm. right after 9-11, yes. which really is this major turning point in That's American right. history. In That's right. Of, you know, race and everything else. Because That's of course, right. we now have a, a situation where maybe for a moment at least, blacks aren't the most despised group. Right. We of course kind of... That's elevate, what they said in the boondocks. Uh, we're number two. So, we're yeah, number yeah. two. Yeah. <laughs> of course, that's, that's, that's very uh, uh, um, <clears throat> precarious though. I mean, you know, in many ways. But right. nonetheless, there is right. this turning point where suddenly we're all Americans because, you know, we're fighting this, this, this new enemy, right? Yes. Uh, and, and so I, I'm not trying to argue that that sets the stage for Obama too, which maybe it does, I don't know, but there are all these other interesting things going on. It seems to be there's some interesting relationships that maybe teased out between historical context, the representation. I think Mariah Carey is the most interesting because she's constantly reinventing herself to try to remain relevant in certain ways. You know what I mean? What do you well, you know, I, uh, with regard to Obama and um, the, the chosen candidate, right, the, the candidate who became the chosen black, you know, prince for the Democratic Party. It was, I did, I did a lot of, I wrote it, <clears throat> uh, there's a, there's a, a, an anthology coming out called Obama Mania, and I have an article in it called Obama Jungle Fever. And I, one of the things I talk about is how, uh, and this is what I read, in, in the, in the months leading up to the election, there was an, a wonderful article in the Washington Monthly that talked about the range of men in the younger generation like Cory Booker and Harold Ford Jr. and, um, and the third one, the third main one is uh, Cory Booker, Harold Ford Jr. Those are the only two I can rem remember right now. Jesse but, Jackson's son? Excuse me? Jesse Jackson's son? I mean, he was, uh, no? These were, these were, um, Light. Oh, okay. Rats. I, okay. yeah, well, this, this, what, what this article was about was, um, basically how the type of black candidate who could appeal across racial lines and the, the type of black candidate where race wasn't the overdetermining factor of identity. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, so for example, they contrasted Barack Obama with somebody like Colin Powell, who was of the, you know, the older generation who still wasn't able to make that kind of, um, I guess, transition. But uh, what I found out is that Harold Ford Jr. was the speaker at the Democratic National Convention in 2000, in 2000, right? Because Barack Obama was the speaker in 2004, and that's what launched him. Mm -hmm. So Harold Ford Jr., who's Harold Ford Jr., is um, the senator from Tennessee, and he's the son of this really powerful mulatto elite family, basically, that's been around forever, forever. <laughs> and, and he has very light skin and blue eyes, right? I mean, talk about, you know, he looks like a mulatto for real. So, uh, so anyway, but with regard to Harold Ford Jr., even though the Democrats gave him this position for the launching pad, uh, as it turned out, the speech wasn't, it was scheduled for the end of the, 
of the program. It wasn't, it wasn't scheduled uh, in, the, in the sort of ideal time slot. And it was also uh, televised in a much less kind of enthusiastic way. Now, bear in mind that there's that. And then there's the fact that when he ran for the Senate in 2010, there was that huge controversy over the television ad that, that um, th does everybody come? Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, his opponent uh, put together an ad, an attack ad. Yeah? Oh, uh, put, put together an attack ad that basically, well, so, so Harold Ford Jr. is called a blue dog Democrat, right? So he's a conservative Democrat who's thought to be able to take the South, which is always the problem, right? Okay, so this Republican opponent put together an ad with normal, you know, ordinary Americans saying things like, Harold Ford Jr. wants to take away our guns, you know, and so on. But then... There's a frame of a white blonde woman, and she's framed with nude shoulders so that it isn't clear whether or not she's wearing clothes. And she says, I met Harold at the Playboy party. Call me Harold, right? <laughs> so there was, there was a huge backlash about that ad because just like when just like when um, Joe Biden called Obama clean and articulate the media was actually on the ball and realized that that was very problematic and they did the same thing with that ad you know it was the, all the history of miscegenation um, and the demonization of black men and so on and so forth and of course this was an ad in Tennessee so it has even more those overtones um, and and when Harold Ford Jr ran for the Senate in 2010, his, his, his placard was the same as Barack Obama, that change, right? It was the same. He had change right there, too. So, um, so uh, he was, I think, maybe at the wrong place at the right time or something like that you know he he some, for some reason didn't quite fit uh, but he's uh, an example of the kind of black you know candidate I think but 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 the thing is you know but the question is 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 he black enough which is all these questions were asked about Obama is he black enough and I think well I guess we decided he is, right? But, but Harold Ford Jr. presents a very different face um, of black people, right? And I don't know if white Americans could quite get it that he's actually black. And I'm not sure if black Americans would see him as, I mean, in, I'm talking about the president now, right? And I don't know that he would have the same kind of... Um, the same kind of impact, and he ended up marrying a white woman. <laughs> After all that, there's this great blog that says, you know, this black woman says, you, you know, you were at the Playboy Mansion, <laughs> you know, Harold. <laughs> so, yeah, and you know, needless to say, he does not have the charisma or anything like that. Yes. Well, I just wanted to make a comment about your, your interracial law overpassing. So there was um, there was a, a case in California, it was called Perez versus Sharp, yep. um, where it was a case of a black man who wanted to marry a white woman because apparently in California, um, Mexican people were considered white because of their Spanish heritage, which is yep. interesting. And so it passed in the state of California, but that was in 1948, and it yes. didn't seem to really have an impact. Mm -hmm. Nation, but it was. It's a black man and a white woman who were denied marriage because of miscegenation laws that were on the books of the state. And that actually, you know, it was ruled unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. But it didn't go to the, to the Supreme no, Court. It, to the it went to the California, um, California Supreme Court. But you're, but you're right, I think. It, it, I think that's a very, very good point. And it's also a really good point that it doesn't, very few people know about it. 
and it doesn't have the same visibility or symbolic value. Uh, I feel like part of that reason is that it was in California. Mm -hmm. I think that that's part of it. And, um, and I think that the laws against, well, let's put it this way. I think that the slave history and the history of Jim Crow is, is simply so significant that um, the ruling coming out of that context, it not only went to the Supreme Court, but it, it, just, has, it just has such a symbolic, yeah. you know, yeah. charge. Yeah. I know, Jefferson State, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I guess I'd rather thank you. Thank you for here. coming. <laughs> thank you for coming. You continue for forever, but thank you all for coming out. Yeah. Be out for the next uh, Circle of Thought, which is? We have a talk on Tuesday. Right. At the public. Um, come out that week. Right, right. Oh. Well, I know who that is. Kamal Daoud? Yeah, he's the, um, the musician poet. Oh, that's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for coming. No it's really nice to see you. What's going on? Uh, finishing my education under minor. Yeah. Um, and waiting for Teach America to see what's going to happen. Oh. Okay. So I applaud. Listen. I can't believe they wouldn't take you. Well, you know, my whole thing is I went to a meeting the other night, uh, a couple weeks ago, and I was really not happy with it. Like, you have to sign in to get into the building. We all get on the elevator. They turn the key to take you to the floor. There's like four women with me, and we walk in, and he's like, oh, hi, are you here for, you know, are you approved? Are you applied? Da, da, da. And the girl goes, oh, I'm a prize. She goes, I'll sign this one. And I said, where's the restroom? And I go to the restroom. I come back. Well, there's nobody there. And he goes, are you here for the meeting? And I just, I'm like, what the fuck do you think I'm here for? I got this big old UCLA shirt on. And you, why can't I be applied or not, you know?